Oh, that sounded good. Wow. We are going to be jumping back into our theme lessons today, so go ahead and uh, grab your Bibles, open it up, and get ready. Uh, I wanted to say not by way of apology, but uh, by way of thank you. My lesson last week was 56 minutes long, which I know some of you are going, and it felt every second of it. I, I, I get that. What I want to say is thank you. Thank you for your willingness to study, even when the sermon goes over. And thank you for your willingness to love God's word and your diligence and your loving of me, because I, reality might be different than what I've been told, but I, I don't know that I've heard a complaint about it yet. That being said, I've told uh, one or two of our elders, that's like a once every 10 years occurrence. I, that is not going to happen again. Um, not because I, I don't think some subject warrant it, but people's rear ends get sore after a while. So we'll, we'll try to tone that in a little bit. And today's sermon is, is pretty simple and uh, I think pretty short. So let's, let's jump on into our sermon for today. We are doing a series based on Acts chapter 2 verse 42. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, and the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And we are talking for these series of months, uh, finishing up uh, in a couple of weeks, on what it means to be devoted continually to the apostles' doctrine, to the apostles' teaching. And I want to build on what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, which was the idea of obedience, that we're not to be merely hearers of the word, but that we are to obey it. We are to be doers of the word. But I am convinced as I read through scripture that just obedience is not enough. Just being those who do the word of God isn't enough. We are called to something even higher than that, which is we must adopt the character of Jesus. That it is not just enough to have a list of do's and don'ts and avoid the don'ts and do the do's but that we are to actually change who we are from the inside out, that we are to develop our character in such a way that people see us and think of Jesus, that they see us and they realize we are being something different than what the world is. There's a lot of verses that talk about this concept. Let's look through them quickly. Romans chapter 8 well, we spent a good bit of time there last week. Uh, I don't know that we spent much time on this verse. Here we're told, For those he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. That we would be conformed to the image of his Son. That we would ourselves become transformed into looking like something other than we are. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. We all, with unveiled faces, are looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord and are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory this is from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So when we look in the mirror, the image that's given to us is not this flesh and blood image that I see peering back at me, but if I look through the flesh and blood image, what I actually see is the glory of God. What I see is not Adam, but I see Jesus. I see the character that God intends for me. Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, and I want to start reading in verse 22. Ephesians 4, 22, uh, let, for the sake of context, read back up to verse 20. But that is not how you came to know Christ, assuming you heard about him and were taught about him as the truth is in Jesus. To take off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness and righteousness and purity of the truth. 
Do you see that? When we talk often about the image of putting away the old man and putting on the new man, that we, we die in baptism and we're raised to walk in newness of life, but that new man is not just a new version of me. The new man has been me put away, and I am raised in the image of God, in the image of Christ. I'm raised in his likeness. A little bit later, chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children, and walk in love as Christ also loved us and gave himself forth, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. Time to imitate God, to be like him. First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, verse 21, For you were called to this, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. We should be like him. It goes on to say, he did not commit sin. So what are we to not do? We're not to commit sin. When he was insulted, he did not insult in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. We are to be like him. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. 1 John 2, verse 6 says, The one who says he remains in him should walk just as he walked. I used the illustration the other day of those comedy movies where it, you know, the, the butler says, walk this way, and he has some sort of limp and of course, the, the comedic response to that is to imitate the limp, to walk exactly like the, uh, the injured or hunched back butler or whichever movie you're referring to. There's always that unique way of walking. We are to walk as Jesus walked. We are to imitate his character. We are to look like him. And that is not merely a checklist of do's and don't, that is actually changing who you are from the inside out, that you now react differently than you always have, that you now think differently by the renewing of your mind in a way that you've never thought before, that you, your automatic response whenever you face conflict is Jesus' automatic response when he faced conflict. That's the next step of being devoted to the apostles' doctrine. That we become more and more like Jesus. I put out on Facebook this week this question. I'm not sure how well you can read that. What about Jesus' character most astonishes you and why? And I got a lot of responses, some from even those of us in this room and and uh, here's, here's some of them from our beloved sister, Joy. Uh, he, his love for the sinner and even on that cross, Father, forgive them. Or a friend of mine from Texas, a preacher there, says his humanity. He laughs and uses sarcasm. He weeps. He loves. He weeps. He hungers and thirsts. Yet he is the fullness of God and the fullness of humanity. The great mystery. Another friend of mine says his selflessness. With all he could do, it was never about him. What an example to mimic. Uh, Kathy put compassion and patience. He wants everyone to be saved and gives them many chances to believe. Kyle Ellison said his ability to meet people right where they were and to recognize their needs. Jesus went beyond just a spiritual need, but might also meet a physical need. Uh, another lady put self-control and patience. I'd have been raining fire from heaven all over the place. Uh, Scott put his willingness to offend people with the truth. Uh, Bill Reed put he, to see people for who and what they really were, to see past the imperfection and the facade to the very core, and to respond to them based on that. Uh, a friend of ours named BJ says his self-control, not only from the passions of the flesh without sin, 
but to contain all that authority and power and not once use it for himself in an improper way. Another friend of ours said how the creator allowed his creation to humiliate him. A lot of great answers. And I think probably most of our answers tend to fall in those veins. If I were to summarize the answers that I received, it was his mercy and forgiveness and compassion and selflessness. Aren't we impressed with that? We're impressed with that, I think, oftentimes because we fail so much in those areas that we fail to show compassion. We fail to show mercy and forgiveness. Others are astonished by his humanity and his relatability. How can God and the flesh be so relatable? How can God and the flesh face all of our weaknesses yet triumph over them? Others were amazed by his love and his restraint or his humility and his patience. Honestly, we can probably sum it up in just two verses of the Bible. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Wouldn't you agree that that's the character of Jesus? That Jesus is the example of the fruit of the Spirit in its most mature form. That Jesus is the epitome of all of these things. He is love. He is joy. He is peace. And we see Jesus in the fruit of the Spirit. But I'm going to tell you there's one other characteristic that astonishes me probably more than any of the rest. Jesus was holy. He's holy. I, I find that so difficult to wrap my brain around that. You know, I, I can in so many ways justify and understand and come up with some sort of human explanation as faulty as those explanations might be as to why he was so loving and joyful and peaceful. But the holiness of Jesus, is it amazes me. He's called holy in so many different places. You know, Mark chapter 1, verse 24, what do you have to do with us, the demon said. What do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of Israel. The, the demons didn't say, you're the one who is love, you are the one of peace, that you are the one who is, who is gentle. <laughs> they weren't pointing out the gentleness of Jesus, were they? They call him the Holy One of Israel. That he was the Holy One. That idea of his, his otherworldly. He, he is something different. He is something that belongs not here. While at the same time he is here. That he is something that is so obviously above and beyond this world and its trappings and its temptations and its difficulties. Jesus is above all of that. That's what they were astonished with. Peter preaches in a sermon, actually twice in Acts chapter 4, where he calls Jesus the Holy Servant Jesus. The Holy Servant Jesus. That there in that sermon where he is being confronted by the Jewish leader, the sermon we've studied just recently, that the thing that astonished Peter, that he had to bring out about his Lord, is that he was a holy servant. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 26. For this is the kind of high priest we need. Holy, innocent undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Let me read that description to you again. 
This is the kind of high priest we need. Holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners and exalted above the heaven. See, what's amazing about Jesus' holiness is that he is that very description. He is holy. He is undefiled. He is separated from us sinners. He is uh, innocent in ways that we cannot understand, in ways that we marvel at, that he is able to come and face every temptation we face and never fail. And what amazes me about that is that he's still relatable. That while he is holy, that he is something separated from us because he has decided to be different than us. You know, we often will try to explain that using some sort of theology or, 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 or philosophy that he the dual nature and that he was in some ways human and that he was in some ways spirit and that his spirit and his humanity, they were in conflict with one another. And, 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 but because he was God, because he was deity, he was able to, to face all those sins and not give in to them because he's God. Never the explanation given in Scripture. If the reason he didn't sin was because he was God, then he didn't really face temptation like you and me, who are not God. He, as a man, faced temptation and won every time. And the reason he won wasn't because he had some sort of power that we don't have or that he had some sort of perspective that we're unable to have. He won because he chose to be better than this world. He chose to be different. He chose to be holy. Just like we're commanded to be holy. And it was such a bold and amazing holiness that it stood out. You know, there's a story told back in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6, if you want to open up to that. We're not going to spend much time there. I think you're probably familiar with this, this call of Isaiah as it's often referred to in your Bibles. Mine says Isaiah's call and mission, where he has this image of the throne room of God, and God is sitting on his throne, and his, his, his uh, train of his robe fills the temple, and he is watching the seraphim that are flying before God that have their face covered with wings, and they have their feet covered with two wings, and they're flying with two wings, and they're out there saying, holy, holy, holy to the Lord of armies. His glory fills the whole earth. And Isaiah's response to that is this, verse 5. Woe is me, for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and live among people of unclean lips, and because my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of armies. And you know that the, the story continues that an angel gets a, a coal from the altar and presses it against Isaiah's lips and declares him clean and then God commissions him to go out into the world and deliver a message. That story we're, we're probably very familiar with. Now I want you to turn with me over to Luke 5. Luke 5. Luke 5 tells the story of the call and mission of the apostles. Crowds pressing in on Jesus. They want to hear what he has to say. He's standing by the lake, and there are two boats there. Fishermen had left him. They were over washing their nets. So he got in one of the boats, which belonged to Simon, and asked him to put out a little bit from the land so that he could separate himself from the people a little bit, and they could hear him speak. When he finished speaking, he decides to go fishing. So he tells Peter, put out in the water. Let's go fishing. And Peter says, Master, We've worked all night. We haven't caught anything. But if you say I should, I will. And he lets down his nets. And when they do, they catch a great number of fish, so much so that their nets, their freshly washed nets, begin to tear. 
So they signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and they filled both boats so full of fish that the boats began to sink. Now look with me here, verse 8. Luke chapter 5, verse 8. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, because I am a sinful man. Isn't it interesting that in a similar story, one where Isaiah appears before God, his response is, I am a sinful man, and God commissions him for the work. And in the other story, Peter is before Jesus in a boat, and when he recognizes who Jesus is, his response is, I am a sinful man, before he is sent to be fishers of men. The only explanation I have of that is that Jesus was as holy as his father. And that the right response in the presence of Jesus was the same as the right response in the presence of the Father, one sitting on the throne, one sitting in a boat. But the response is the same. I am unclean. Jesus came to this earth with a job job was to reveal the character of the Father. His job was to display the goodness of the King. His job was to redeem a humanity that could not redeem themselves, to save us. His job was to come and be the Messiah. And Jesus came down and he was everything his Father sent him to be. I put created there because in a sense, Jesus is created as human even though he is God and he is eternal. I'm not dismissing that concept either. But Jesus, when he came to this earth, he committed himself from the earliest days to be everything God called him to be, which meant being holy, being sinless, being devoted, being exactly what God intended. Do we do that? Do we do that? Are we holy like that? Because if you turn back to Galatians chapter 5, where you've got that great listing of the fruit of the Spirit, the one that we noticed was just epitomized by Jesus and his own character, these are the next two verses. Now those who belong in Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Do you remember how many verses we read that said, walk in the steps of Jesus? That we would walk as he walked? That's the same picture we have here with the Spirit. Walk 